Before I begin, I feel it is necessary to point out that the news arm of the BBC has yet to retract, apologize, or otherwise address the deeply transphobic reporting it has engaged in in the last few months. In a pinned comment down below, you'll find my original video on the topic, several videos from the YouTuber Sean, who has been ongoing in his pursuit of trying to get the BBC to own up to what they have done, and also a video from Laura Kate Dale showing the protests that have taken place outside of the BBC offices. While I don't feel any of the people behind Doctor Who are in any way responsible for this, I cannot in good conscience talk about a BBC-owned property without mentioning this first, until such time as it is properly redressed. Thank you. Well, we've all heard of ending a season with a bang. You ready for ending a season with a... The Battle of Ranscor Av Kolos. I remembered being frustrated and kind of confounded by this. There were a lot of specifics that I forgot, and there were some things that I remembered that are worse now that I'm paying more attention to them. I think, in a way, while I never really liked this episode, I think it benefited a bit from my not having gone back and rewatched it or thought much about it since originally seeing it. I didn't have a good opinion of it, but it was an undetailed bad opinion. It was, uh, eh, it just wasn't that good. Going back and rewatching it, uh, I've got, I've got a lot. <laughs> I've got a lot to cover here. Um, terrible payoffs. Uh, it really, it, it strikes my nerve on terrible depictions of the very concept of faith in uh, science fiction, which is something I've covered on Doctor Who specifically. I'm talking about one of the novels that the 13th Doctor featured in. So, like, if you really want to hear me go off on it there, you can. But I, I am going to bring it up again here. And then there's a, the handful of ideas here that are interesting but don't matter at all. So where do we even start with this? Well, let's, I suppose, start where the episode starts. With the Ux. God, Chibno, why do you suck at alien names so much? The Ux? The... Uh, and not only is it a terrible name, the doctor says it a lot. The Ox. The Ox. The Ox. The Ox. The Ox. Ox. It's like you wanted to bring extra attention to how bad it just sits on the ear and how it doesn't, it doesn't sound right. It doesn't flow into a conversation. Every time it gets said, it's like the sentence stops dead so we can fit in Ox. Like, oh God. Now that's nitpicky, but... Look, strap in. I'm not going to have a lot of nice things to say about this one. So we start with them. And the whole thing with their species is they are deeply religious and there's always only two of them. How does that work from a uh, continuing the species biological standpoint? No idea. We're never going to explore that. Does it matter that there's only two? No, actually, it really doesn't. Um, these, like, for all intents and purposes... It makes way less sense that the Ux is a species than if it had simply been a religious order. That would have made way more sense and would have left no real lingering questions for me that I've got about the idea that this is actually a species. And also, it's severely reductive, the fact that the Doctor's like, oh, the Ux are always fanatical. And yes, the display of this backs, backs that up. But I'm like, that's, that's really reductive. And I just don't like it as an approach to... <laughs> To presenting a supposed species, they should have just been a, a cult, which they kind of are, but like making the cult synonymous with the species, don't love it. Don't love that. But my real issue with, I'm just like, first of all, this is a revisit review. You should know there's going to be spoilers, but I'm going to be talking all over this place. And if I'm talking about the Ux, that's going to include jumping to the end uh, and talking about the stuff at the end. So, all right, where do we start? Let's start with the general notion, very common in science fiction, when dealing with people of faith, 
that they are idiots and will just assume that somebody who drops out of the sky, you must be our God. Do they actually match the specific description of your supposed God or creator in this case? And I actually think that's a distinction worth making because if it was just like a more omnipotent thing, then some stuff later like makes even less sense. But just the idea of a creator, oh, like, okay, fine, we'll go with that. But like, you just assume that whoever dropped out of the sky is your creator. Does he perfectly match your understanding, description of what the creator is? is does he know the things the creator should know we don't cover any of those questions we just leave them hanging which means it's either the biggest freaking coincidence in the universe that simshaw just happened to land where these two people were at the time that they were there and happens to perfectly line up with something that they will mistake for their creator so it's either that or they are the biggest freaking idiots in the universe because they just assumed anybody who showed up must be their creator. It's one of the two. It's either the biggest coincidence in a series that has given us more than a few massive bleeding coincidences that I've complained about as we've gone. This is either the biggest one by a factor of 10 or they are insanely stupid. And unfortunately, given what goes on later with their betrayal, not betrayal, portrayal, in terms of what's shown with them and what gets them on the doctor's side, I'm going to lean towards the latter because this seems to, again, have a very bad concept of what faith even is. I mean, it's very, it's, it's insanely frustratingly common. For science fiction depiction, this isn't specific to Doctor Who, this is all over the place, to basically treat anyone of faith as a fanatic. There is almost no room for someone who simply uses faith as a guide in their life. They have to believe it at its most literal sense. They're almost always fundamentalists and they're almost always fanatical so that they make better straw men. If you're going there, which just isn't even really, do, this isn't even really doing the skewering of religion, but it still plays into the same tropes because later on, these people whose faith is so strong, it allows them to reshape the freaking universe can have their faith completely shaken by the doctor showing up and going, but that's not your creator. Oh, it's not. Oh, I'm so uncertain now. I will now join you. Again, it just makes them look really, really stupid because this either means that they have been following a creator that they've been doubting up to this point and it's implied that the doctor bringing up what she brings up it just is the last straw and what's tipping the scale, in which case, why were you doing what you were doing for a god you weren't sure was real? So they're either stupid for that or it's this really belittling sense of faith that, well, here, let me apply a little bit of logic to your faith and that'll break you out of your beliefs. That's not how faith works. That's why you can't logic somebody out of their religion. They, ah, I'm not gonna dwell too much more on this, but it's really, it's dumb, it's condescending. And the only reason I'm not gonna dwell on it more is I don't think that skewering religion was actually the point the way it was in that novel that I went off on uh, a little bit ago. But it is absolutely here, same nonsense, same tropes, don't like it. And again, if you haven't watched that other video that I referenced earlier, I'm not a person of faith. I'm not taking this person. I'm not going, you're insulting my religion. I'm not religious. I wasn't raised religious. My family's not religious. I just think this is really dumb and belittling and insulting in a really closed-minded way to look at and continually depict religion in a genre that I actually normally like. So that's the first big thing. Next big thing, Simshaw. He's back. And boy, does that mean nothing. Like, here's the thing. Yes, technically, he was set up as having lived at the end of the woman who fell to earth. And on paper, because I say this so much about Chibnall's era, on paper, you could say that his disappearance and the fact that he wasn't killed sets him up to return at some point. You can make that argument. <laughs> however, however, 
A, he wasn't that great a villain in the first dang place. He wasn't super intimidating. He was only a threat just largely because he was cheating at what he was supposed to be doing in the first place, which he's doing again here. So again, he doesn't come across as a threat. He's just happens to have access to stuff that makes him a threat, which makes him a buffoon, not because of something the doctor and the companions do, just by his nature. So that's your first thing. He was not a villain worth bringing back in the first place. But more important than that, it doesn't work even as a follow-up to a woman who fell to Earth because nothing about where he ended up and who he hooked up with, i.e. the Ux, that is not a reasonable consequence of his escape at the end of the original because he wasn't supposed to end up here. The doctor in this very episode says herself, she set his transport, emergency teleport, whatever. It was supposed to send him back where he came from, but he ended up 3,000 blah, 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 blah years ago on the planet where these two chuckleheads are are occupying and are going to mistake him for a god. That's not a natural consequence. That doesn't even vaguely make sense. So it's not like this is a fallout of the doctor or companion or even whatever his face was who kicked uh, Simshaw off of the, uh, the crane in the first place. And she got all uppity about that. This is not a reasonable consequence of any of their actions. Like, honestly, if they wanted to have, if they wanted to bring a villain back and have consequences for the actions, I'm not saying he fits the actual story here, but Krasko would have made a hell of a lot more sense because I brought up before, Ryan disobeyed the doctor, ignored what she said about what he shouldn't be messing with and what he shouldn't be doing to blast Krasko to some point point in history, Ryan didn't even know where he sent him. That would have made sense to have consequences to because he was disregarding the advice given to him by someone who knows better. That would have been something to have, to have these kinds of consequences to, but not Simshaw. And it's made worse by the fact that the natural progression to this would have been something more like what was done in series one. So to make the comparison, series one, not in the first episode, but early on, introduce us to Dalek. Establish a Dalek. Show us why a Dalek is incredibly dangerous. And then, in the finale, give us a fleet of them. And so that we understand, oh, oh, this is bad. Here, they set it up like they're going to do that. Introduce Shimshaw at the start. And then, very next episode... Bring up the Stenza again. That's his species. Put some emphasis on, on their weapons development. That's what the, that whole planet was in the Ghost Monument. They're making weapons. What are they using them for? This species is dangerous. Yes, he was a danger and he was trying to be the leader, but like this species is dangerous. So we've gone, here's what one of them is like. Imagine what so many of them are like. And now here's that same one again. That's not the trajectory you set up. You set yourself up for something that you didn't pay off. <laughs> like, why, why, in that case, did you bother building up the Stenza as a species threat if the only one we were ever going to deal with is this one freaking dude? And yes, you could possibly make the argument, well, maybe the original plan was to bring the Stenza in in the next series. And yes, maybe that's possible. And maybe Chibnall chickened out on that after realizing that nobody was impressed with this guy. But if that was the plan, it still makes for a bad season of television here. Because again, just on his own, he was a new villain worth bringing back. And you set up this trajectory that you undercut. Because, again, him coming back, it's not like he's got all of the Stenza technology again that we saw in Ghost Monument. Even, well, he has some of it. I'll come back to that. But it's not like he's suddenly armed with, oh, the Stenza technology. He was just working with bare bones stuff. And that would have, in addition to bringing him back, would have built up the species as a thing. But it's not even doing that. It's just, here's that dude again. Now, I mentioned, like, some of the technology does come back. The sniper bots show up again. Oh, my gosh. Okay. The sniper bots were not good in the Ghost Monument, but I was prepared to give a little bit of leeway because I don't think they actually had a line to cover this, but at least in terms of the visual presentation, you could make uh, a head cannon that those ones were old, hadn't been used for a while. That's why they were so crap. Here... They're just crap. Like they get they get beaten. 
because Graham and Ryan get between two squads of them and then duck and they shoot each other. And yes, I know, I didn't have a problem with Chibnall doing that later in Eva the Daleks, but I was okay with that for two reasons. One, if you got Daleks angry enough, which you can, Daleks can get very angry, I could actually see them making that kind of mistake, A, and B, because of the nature of that story and the time loop coming back into itself, that wasn't the way that they were defeated, that was just the way to temporarily get out of that immediate situation. So... I was okay with that there. Here, this is just like, and now we don't have to worry about the sniper bots anymore because they all shot each other. Oh my God. And then we can start getting into wasted potential. First of all, uh, this whole idea that the planet has psychokinetic waves coming off it, that mess with the mind, with the head. You know how that factors into the story? It doesn't. It doesn't. What? What? Why would you set up a world that by design and you say flat out messes with people's heads if you're not going to have it mess with anybody's head at any point? The only way, the only way in which this factors in at all at any point in this thing is that it's an explanation as to why Mark Addy, who, bless him, he is trying so hard. and He's giving about as good a performance as could have been given with the material he had. But it explains why his character doesn't know everything and he's sort of remembering stuff as time goes on. But you could have done that just by giving him a concussion. You didn't have to come up with this idea for a psychic planet when that notion doesn't fit into any... Th I'm not even sure what the themes of this are, but it doesn't fit in thematically and it doesn't even come in logistically as to actually being a hazard or a problem. You built up all this thing and you give all the characters like these psychic dampeners or whatever the hell they are so that they're not impacted by the planet. Later on, you have the Doctor and Yaz take theirs off, put them on the Ux, and you know what happens? You know what the consequences is of them taking those off? This... That's it. That's it. Ah, oh no. They got a mild headache. What the heck? How? How do you come up with a concept that enables you to really mess with a character, to throw them off the back, but to give them a hurdle that is difficult to overcome and just not have it do any of that. Again, it feels reverse engineered. The only way that I can think that this could have possibly happened because I just, I cannot, I can't, I cannot imagine a scenario in which a writer goes and the and they'll be landing on a planet that emits psychic waves that won't come up and they won't matter. But anyways, I, I can't imagine that happening. What I can imagine happening is somebody going, okay, and they're on this planet and they run into this guy and he doesn't know what's going on. Well, why doesn't he know what's going on? Oh, I should explain that. Uh, well, there, there's like psychic waves on the planet. There we go. Well, shouldn't that affect the doctor and the and the companions? Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, we'll put psychic dampeners on them. There we go. And now suddenly you have a concept that you created to cover a logistical issue that you then had to layer more stuff into to cover the, to cover the potential holes that come out of that. And you've sunk all this time into something that doesn't need to exist at all. That's the only way in my mind that I can come up with anybody coming up with a concept like this and doing literally nothing with it. I should talk about Graham because that's about the one other major-ish element to this other than the list of nitpicks I'm gonna finish this whole thing off with. So they do this whole thing with Graham where once he realizes uh, Simshaw is there, that he wants to kill him out of revenge for Grace. Now, there's a couple of problems with this, although it might also have been a reverse engineered writing problem because th wanting to do that might be why this is Simshaw instead of any other or a group of Stenza. Maybe it was decided, well, Graham isn't the kind of person who's going to hold it against the whole species. He's only going to hold it against that one guy. Well, I guess we have to have it be that one guy. Except the problem is Graham is coming off It Takes You Away, which while not wholly about grief and getting over it and loneliness, that was a major element of it. And he had to say goodbye to a version of Grace and... While you can, you know, make the claim, well, it's not that easy if he sees the 
you know, the guy who killed her again, maybe, maybe it will reignite his anger. Like, yeah, maybe, but like narratively, that's deeply unsatisfying. Like you just barely put him as a character in a place where I'm not saying he's moved on from grace, but where that notion of I'm now driven by revenge. I'm like, you, you just, you just had some degree of closure, or at the very least, you had to set aside your emotional investment in Grace and her loss in order to do something. And now it's implying that, well, no, well, he can't do that. He just did it. Last episode, he just did that. So that's the first thing. The the order that these episodes happen in, that causes that problem. But even in and of itself, it just seems a little bit out of character. And like, to a degree, it almost kind of works because I can kind of buy Graham, you know, thinking, oh, this is my chance. I'll take revenge and thinking that that's what he should do, that that's what a grieving husband should do. That's what uh, a man who's been pushed uh, to an edge by loss should do, but that he's not actually capable of doing it, except it doesn't put enough focus on that for that to act like, again, on paper, that's kind of the arc, but it's not really properly done. And then it's severely undercut by the very end where he and Ryan put Simshaw into this stasis thing, which I have to assume was done to theoretically bring him back for a third freaking time, which never happened. I say never. We got the centenary special coming up. Don't jinx it. But they put him in this stasis for forever, in theory. And other people have pointed this out, and I'm not going to hammer on it as much because I do think it's the kind of rationalization a lot of people would do, thinking, well, I didn't kill them, therefore I'm the better person. But it is a little messed up that you don't kill him, but you trap him for eternity, which some would argue is worse. Now, I was going to lay this uh, alongside some of the other uh, moral wonkiness with the doctor herself, except it's not made entirely clear if the doctor fully understands what it is they did because she's not with them when they encounter the stasis pods and like realize what the deal with them is, nor is she there when they lock him up. So it's possible that she doesn't realize how bad the situation they just left him in is, which does make her incurious, which is that's odd for the doctor. But I'm not going to lay this on the same level of moral compass feels off that I felt about things like uh, arachnids in the UK. It doesn't quite have that level. That having been said, there, there is a little bit, I, I have some frustration with some of the lines that she has when questioned by Ryan and, you know, it turns out she has brought bombs. And again, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It could work as a core component of this doctor. But again, it feels more like this is reverse engineered because this is what allows the story as we've sketched it out to happen. So she's brought bombs with her and Ryan points out, you know, you said we're not supposed to be using weapons. You got all mad at me that time I picked up a sniper bot thing. And what she says to him is... Also, don't cut that back to me. Our rules change all the time. Here's the thing. As a general concept, that can work in the same way that for like 11, the doctor lies, that can be a thing. The idea of the rules can and will change as you better understand them or as I need them to, or maybe I'm simplifying the rules down to a way that you will understand them, but they're actually more complicated. And to you, what seem like contradictions actually do make sense to me, but it's not doing any of that. Again, it just feels reverse engineered. It just feels like, well, uh, so she's going to bring this thing uh, onto the the ship and because um, it's what they want. Well, that sounds dumb. What if they just kill her and take it? Well, she should have a security plan in place. Okay, so she'll put a bomb on it. Wait, wouldn't the companions be like, why do you have bonds? Oh, okay, well, we'll put this line in. Again, it's feeling reverse engineered. So these don't feel like characterization choices. They just feel like trying to plug the plot holes as you go and then not thinking about what that means in terms of the character and whether or not it's bringing up something that fits what you've been doing or something you're going to do anything with in the future. And then there's like just some random small stuff. The doctor being all like, oh, that's impossible with the shrunken planets. Like... It's not. The pirate planet did it. 
back in Tom Baker's era, which, like, I understand that the audience doesn't necessarily know that, but shouldn't it be somebody's job on the team to say something like, I haven't seen this since, blah, 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 blah? Because this is basically combining the Crush Down Planets concept from that with the whole thing at the um, what, Journey's End with the stolen planets being used to power something. It's just shoving those two ideas together. They've both been done. It's not impossible, Doctor. Catch up. Like I said, Mark Addy, he's trying, but he's wasted. Like any actor would have been wasted in that role. The ending is techno babble. Like there's a few things that aren't terrible. Some of it's shot pretty decently. Uh, there's a little exchange between Ryan and Graham that as much as I may not think that Graham suddenly out for revenge really works, like it's not as bad as a lot of what else is going on here, but it doesn't really work. Um, as as hard as he is trying to sell it as an actor, there is a little exchange between him and Ryan that I like. You think that's what men would want? No, I think your men would want to be alive. She actually liked being alive and she was really good at it. And I like the closing speech from the doctor. None of us know for sure what's out there. That's why we keep looking. I remember watching for the first time, it was about the first time I was like, oh, I think I, I'm kind of starting to get you now and like what your approach is and how this doctor ticks. Um, it, it didn't help as much as I'd hoped it would uh, going forward, unfortunately. But like, that's a decent closing moment for the thing. But wow, this is not a good episode in and of itself. As a finale, as a wrap up, as a supposed payoff to anything, Oh, it just it just makes everything that much worse. But what do you think about this one? The Battle of Ranscor of Kolos. You rewatched it lately? What do you think about it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Patreon's what pays the bills. Allows me to do this as my living. Any support you can give is a big help. But even if you can't do that, there's other things that there's links to down in the description. Other ways you can support me or other things that I do on other platforms that you can check out as well. But uh, don't worry too much about it. The like, share, subscribe help me out as well. But what I really want you to remember is you are beautiful. You are valid. You are loved. You are the council. I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned. Hey, end credits time, which means I need to shout out some patrons. This time, I'm going to be shouting out Robin Moore. Zubin Latfala, Tarak, Oliver B, Melinda Walters, Imudelki, The Oath the Boy, TT, Renobulax the Poodle, Zach Paul, Eidolon, Tracy Scrabbit, Vincent Paul Bartolucci, Angry Casperl, Toku BL Huvian, Adam RDL Taylor, Shane Ross, Shayla Gourlay, and Brendan LaRose. You want to hear me mispronounce your name? Check out rewards on the Patreon. Thanks for all your support.